uh, turning your Bibles to Philemon, and we're also going to be looking at some scripture from Colossians chapter 4, which was the church that uh, Paul spoke of Philemon and said, greet the church that meets at your house. Well, the church that met at Philemon's house was the church in the city of Colossae, what we know as the book of Colossians. And uh, in Colossians chapter 4, uh, Paul lists some names there. So this morning, uh, we, we, this is our fifth part of the series here called The Ripple Effect. And uh, The Ripple Effect is, we started this talking about some small act like throwing a, a stone in a pond creates ripples that go out and touch every part of that pond and then come back again. And nothing creates a ripple effect in our lives and, and echoes out from us like the relationships that we develop and the connections that we have. And so as we get into that this morning, I just feel, think it's great that we were able to illustrate that in ways that go far beyond us, just in praying for missionaries and and having other missionaries pray for other missionaries that are going out and creating ripples, and, and those will, will come back to us and uh, hear rejoicing. Uh, looked up and just blessed my heart and made my heart smile to see the Norrises over here, or, or at least part of the Norrises, dad and daughter Norris. Uh, and so just being a part of that, Doug was such a key part and had a leadership role here for several years and uh, disobeyed his pastor and... Uh, uh, was in exile in Alabama. We're believing that God's going to bring him back just like he did all of this chosen people back to the promised land, but doing a great job and just felt like that was a season in their life to transition. And, you know, when we have life-giving connections, um, life always flows from those relationships. It's a powerful thing. And so today we're going to talk about the power of, of the ripple effect, but particularly the power of making connections in our life. And that's why we had these uh, little deals here given out. It's not just some cheesy thing. We're going to uh, illustrate this powerfully. And uh, here in a moment, hopefully it's, it's powerful and makes an impact to you. But I want to set the, the background here this morning for that. And as we do, we want to certainly make a connection with everybody that's here. This may not be a, a return time for you. This may be your first time. And we want that to be just as comfortable for you as it is your 20th time or 200th time or those of you that have been saying uh, some of you have been coming to this church longer than I've been pastor uh, and that's okay too that just says something about faithfulness and consistency amen but particularly all of our first timers this morning we just want to take a second here and welcome you and, and connect with you personally through uh, thanking you for being here and uh, corporately just from welcoming you here would all of our first timers just lift your hand and let us know who you are this morning. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Welcome them. Just one more point of connection this morning. Uh, all of our first timers, we have a special gift for you. Uh, in addition to the special gift you've already received when you came in, we're double dipping this morning. And so uh, if you'd fill out the connection card uh, there in your bulletin and tear that off and take it out, we'll give you a gift right here at the Fresh Start booth after service this morning. So, amen, welcome, welcome. And uh, here, let me just share a scripture. Actually, I got four questions for you this morning that we're gonna frame the message around. And the first one isn't necessarily a point in the message. It's just kind of to get us on the same page and, and to ask you. And that question is, who are the people who've had the greatest relational impact in your life? Okay, who are they? Now, let's think about that for a second, because the, the immediate response tells you a lot. That, that if you can think of a long list, and it's like, oh, wow, there's so many people, or if it's hard for you to think of one, both of those things tell you something. And more than anything else, what we see is that our God is a God of connection, particularly in relationships. And before there was anybody for him to connect with that he had created in his own image and likeness to have relationship with, he had relationship with himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what we call the Holy Trinity, dwelling together for all eternity. That God's nature is to be 
intimately in relationship. And so when he made us, he made us in his image and in his likeness. Uh, and he, he used the plural, not my image and my likeness. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then let him rule over the fish of the sea. And so he gave him traits and qualities that up to that time only God had had. Dominion and the ability to create and the ability to rule. And as we sang this morning to the, to the Father, you reign over all the earth, you reign. And the Father says to us that when we connect with Him, He wants us to reign as well and to rule over our circumstances and to have be people who exercise that dominion not in a controlling way of power, but in a way that of serving them to bring everyone in connection and relationship with the Father. And so here this morning, what I want you to see more than anything else is that when we live connected lives, we live effective lives. And the statement that I put there in your note, a disconnected life is a disappointing life. Because relationships are God's tool. People, God brings into our life to help us fulfill our purpose and to enjoy the journey. It's not always easy. It's not the fact that we're connected. The reality is we are connected. But some people we're connected to in a negative way. We'll talk about that in a moment. Other people we connect to and we don't realize how profound those connections are going to be in our life. Uh, Liz came to spend the part of the weekend with us and uh, really came to bring Morgan to us, our precious granddaughter, and she's included in that. She's, you know, now she's the daughter, and, but now we, we, we love and kiss on Morgan before we do Liz when she gets home, and we just say, thank you for bringing her. And then she goes through her list of what she wants, and just kidding. But, but as we were there, uh, we, we had a connection. Morgan doesn't know that. Morgan doesn't know that genetically, it's more than just that this is the beautiful, handsome face she loves to look at, this is the voice that just makes her smile. And she gets the biggest smiles and the biggest eyes from hearing Pop's voice. Uh, but, but she doesn't know that connection yet. She doesn't know that relationship. But she's connected. And, and even if it was just the fact that now she's connected with not just me, but our church body, not just because I'm the pastor, but relationally. And I'm sure uh, Mama Leslie or, or somebody's loving on her back in the nursery this morning and she doesn't know that connection. But as she grows and matures, and they'll talk to her, and they'll say things probably at her uh, significant events in her life, maybe graduation, maybe a, a marriage ceremony, if we ever allow, if find anyone on life who might qualify to, to meet that need. Uh, you got it, didn't you? That, that's connection right there, baby. You, you understand. But, but they will say, uh, they'll come up, and undoubtedly, because it's happened to all of us, and if it hadn't happened to you, we can make it happen to you because you need that level of humility. You need somebody in your life that's been in your life long enough to embarrass you and you respect them for it. You know where I'm going with this, right? And so it's like I had great aunts. Uh, uh, both my parents were only children, so we didn't have any first cousins, aunts and uncles, that kind of deal. And, but I didn't miss out in life. Our family was so connected and, and so loud and so involved that that we couldn't have lived through aunts and uncles and first cousins and that kind of thing. So we just had to extend it out one, one level, one ripple. And so all of my great aunts and then their friends would come and every event, if it was graduation or uh, a wedding or when we took family home and we're introducing them, they're just themselves, but they always tell the story about when they changed your diaper and when this happened and it's, you know, it's, those embarrassing things, uh, especially when you're 15 or 16 or 18 or 20 or whatever, and you're like, oh, you know what's coming. You know the story. But the power of that connection is that, that there's a grace with that relationship because the connection was more than just taking care of a need that you couldn't take care of for yourself at being an infant uh, and being totally dependent upon others. But it was the fact that they cared and they nurtured and whatever. And so 
somehow we innately know that that level of connection gives us the right <laughs> to, to speak that into somebody's life and to share that with whomever might be in that place. And we realize sometimes that connections we make because of a need that we have, but we don't realize how deep they go and how wide they extend. That's the power of the ripple effect. That sometimes a small act of kindness creates ripple effect that can't be measured. And so here this morning, I want us to see that, that Paul, when he writes this handwritten note to Philemon and writes it from a prison cell and his companion was Onesimus, that he writes this letter to reconcile a relationship between Philemon and Onesimus a slave owner and his runaway slave. A man whom Paul had probably led to the Lord in Philemon, who now hosted the church in his house at Colossae, who Paul affirms and continues his relationship with, but now there's an issue. And so here he is inconvenienced in a prison cell for preaching the gospel, and his cellmate, his companion there is Onesimus, the one who has issues with Philemon and he has ran away and he's either stolen something or broken something or Paul's just making sure that look not only do we restore a relationship but or reconcile a relationship but we need to restore the damage that's been done and, and maybe repay him how I many know that sometimes we need to uh, deal with the consequences of an action and not just the action itself sometimes we do need to make restitution if possible and so Paul says I'm writing this in my own hand I'm writing it to you here's here's the incredible thing to me to, to write a, a note like this that is so deeply personal and specific um, is is one thing and the fact that we would have and see Paul's heart in the compassion the depth with which he writes, the love that motivates him, the tone of that letter that's just like, man, I, I just can't help but, but take, just kind of hang on every word. And who would have thought that we could take 25 verses of Scripture and spend six weeks developing it, even more than that if you include on Wednesday nights. It's not because it's long and boring, it's because it's so power-packed, because of the relationship and the connection that was there is so deep and the ripples go so wide that it's not chaotic, it's just incredibly powerful. Can you say amen? Here's what I want you to see today. First of all, that when I read the letter, I can't help but put myself in different positions. It's kind of like when you hear a song for the first time and you hear it from one perspective. You know, it might be a love song and, and the words to the song might be, you know, how much somebody loves you. And, and so you're the object of that. And, and somebody pins the song and puts the notes to it. And it's like, oh, wow, that's, I like that song. I, I like what it's saying. Other times, you might be in the other position the, of the, the person saying, I wish I could express this. I wish I could use this to express to you what I feel in my heart. Other times, to me, I think about the songwriter. Who, who was it? What did they convey? How did they capture that so powerfully with words and music to move my heart like that? And, and this letter, Philemon, does the same thing to me. It, it almost causes me to say, okay, I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to be Philemon. And so I put myself in his place, and I try to imagine the surroundings. And, and I know my mind is just much more brilliant than, than many of you this morning because you're bored. And so, work with me here, all right? And, and, and we're going to make a connection. That other times I write from, or read it from the aspect of Onesimus. And, and I hear the crinkling of the parchment when Paul hands it back. Or think, what, how deep did their discussions go? What, what did they share at that level? Sometimes I think from Paul's perspective. That, that here, when he was so 
willing to address things and just take them head on. Smack them in the face, if you will. But here, there's such a depth of humility that, that he says even, look, I'm an old man writing from a prison cell. It was a non-threatening tone. It's like Grandpa writing a note and saying, you might not know this. I, I may have never shared this about my life. And it's like Paul is imagining the bondage that he lived in and, and the, the, the slavery that was his in the, being a Pharisee and being, feeling like he had to be somebody that he wasn't, but it's all he knew how to be, so he did it with a ferocious intensity that destroyed relationships instead of built them, even with the church. But here, he, he writes from a heart of just incredible compassion and love and humility. And he's, you can see he's just building, he's knitting, he's weaving these cords together. And in the midst of it, he doesn't just address Philemon. And he doesn't just address Onesimus. He mentions by name ten other people. Now that strikes me. That, that if you're going to take the time in, in, in a place and receive writing instruments and parchment paper and, and, and process through this 25 lines, if you will, to bring reconciliation and send this note back with Onesimus, I don't think I would take the time to mention 10 other people. But Paul does. And there's a reason he does. And that reason is because all of those people were intimately connected with Philemon and Onesimus. All those people were intimately connected with Paul. In fact, he mentions 10 of them specifically by name, but he mentions and, and the church that meets at your house. So several hundred more would be included. But it's not Paul's letter to a bunch of folks because I'm lonely and I just want you to know I miss y'all and I love y'all, y'all, I love y'all. It's not a generic thing. He's writing to one man to be reconciled to another man. He's writing to a person of position, but he doesn't miss the fact that, that he's a husband and a father. He's a church leader. He's a wealthy man that lives in a really nice part of town and has a large house because a bunch of folks meet there consistently for church. That he's got a heart for God, but he's also got issues that need to be resolved. That the connection that he has with one person is negative and it's going to undermine the connection that he has with a bunch of people that is purpose-filled and life-giving. And thus, back to my point, that we are all connected. But we're not connected with every person in a positive way. That, that some of those connections are based in difficulty and pain and strife and unforgiveness and disagreement. Maybe legal issues or you feel like our rights have been violated. Other of those connections are because we share a common goal and a purpose, not just in Christ, but a passion in life. Several thousand people, millions of people probably, gathered around the country yesterday because it's one of the greatest days of the year. College football season opening day. Come on, somebody. <laughs> somebody asked this morning if I was uh, here supporting the Big Red. Yes, I am. Because I bleed red, and so do you, and everybody. Just kidding, you, you missed that. I'm here because Breck and I coordinated wardrobes this morning, and we wanted to make sure that we matched. Just kidding, all right? And, and so there's an excitement and there's a gathering around that just because of a common shared interest. It's neither right nor wrong. Some of you think it is. Uh, others of you, you know, we can, we can take it too far. But that's my point. Why are people willing to connect around so many different things, so many different interests, while other people say, I could care less? Okay? While well, some people are connecting and going to great uh, means of discomfort or inconvenience, such as finding a parking space or sitting in 
mid-90 degree temperatures and double-digit humidity and, and uh, having levels of discomfort and being connected with people through uh, exchanging handshakes that are slick and slimy and ooh, and watch guys on a football field playing a game. Why? Because we're all wired to connect. It's how we connect. It's who we connect with. And it's what kind of connection that we make. And so that aspect is what I want to look at this morning. And I want to base it out of Paul's letter here. And just throw this out to you as we begin. In Philemon, there in the letter, if you turn there uh, in your uh, Bibles, let's look at a couple scriptures. The, the first and then the last. Paul and Philemon's uh, uh, letter here, the first three verses, he mentions uh, five people. And then in the last uh, two verses, next to the last two verses, he mentions five others. Um, and including Philemon and Onesimus to whom he writes the letter to. So, so let me share this with you. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, to Timothy, our brother. Then he writes, here, here's the opening, to Philemon, our dear friend, our fellow worker, to Apphia, which would have been his wife, our sister, to Archippus, which would have been Philemon's son, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Get down to verse 23. The, the heart of the note, of course, is navigating through the reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus and, and getting it down. So he concludes it with this. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke my fellow workers. Okay? All totaled, that's 10 people. So, so now I want to ask you again the question that I opened with. Who has had the greatest relational impact in your life? Let, let's expand it. If, if Paul would list 10 people by name when his point was to address one, he doesn't say to my top 10 list. He says, to one, Philemon. This note is to you. But no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself alone. Paul realizes in his thinking is, and to those that you're closely connected with. And so he mentions them. Your wife, your son, Epaphras, who undoubtedly founded the church or started the church in Colossae, who's praying for him, who's wrestling with him. And then people that are with Paul that are part of the church there. Onesimus, who was part of Philemon's household, but now has, has been extended into his spiritual family because Paul led him to Christ. And so Paul said, now he's become my son while he's here in prison, and I'm sending him back to you, but not as a slave, as in a whole different relationship, better than a slave, a son in Christ Jesus. And so he implores Philemon, receive him like that. And then he brings himself into the equation, a different level of connection. If you consider me a partner, not a pastor, not an evangelist, not a spiritual authority, if you, Philemon, consider me a partner on the same level, co-worker, invested in this thing together with you, then you receive him. And I know you're going to refresh my heart. You're going to do more than I ask. And then he switches and he says, Epaphras says, hey, he sends his greetings. He's one of you. Mark sends his greetings. He's here with me. Demas sends his greetings. Aristarchus sends his greetings. All, and he goes down through the list. So who's your top ten? In your notes, would you do something for me? You see the section there that says my top ten? Would you do one thing? I think there are five lines there. Would you draw a line straight down the middle of that? J just divide that, that section. And what I want you to see is, as you draw that line down through the middle of that, it, it takes five lines, of course, and divides them and makes a ten. 
Not just that it's handy for you to fill in 10 names, but every time you extend the line downward, it forms a cross over the line above it. That, that I want you to see that, that God brings it together and some people are in our lives for a reason. Some people are in our lives for a season. Some people are in our lives for a lifetime. But all of those relationships make an impact and last. We all have people that have been in our lives and we think, man, they left far too soon and I, I wish I could have just a few more days with them or just some of the experiences that we had didn't last a long time, but they were so intense that, that it affected our life forever. We think, and that's a life lesson. Some we didn't even realize how powerful it was until after the fact. Sometimes years later, and we think, man, that, that that person took time to care. That person took time to pray for me. That person took time just to, to put up with me when I was just stupid. That, that they liked me when I didn't even like me. And, and, and they were, there was that investment. Sometimes it's a depth. Sometimes it's a shared experience. But we're all connected. I want you to, to just jot down some names that come to your mind, but not take the entire time to do that. But I want you to do it. And then I want you to follow up with that and to, to do what Paul did here. I want you just to take time to write a note. You can text. You can use Facebook, but don't cheat. And by that I mean, don't fail to say what needs to be said before it's too late to say it. And realize that you're not in this thing alone. Author uh, Alex Haley that wrote the Roots uh, books and, and other things, but that's his most famous, uh, is said to have had a picture in his office of a, turtle sitting on top of a fence post and every time he was asked about the picture what what that seems rather unusual why would you have a picture of a turtle on a fence post he said because that reminds me that that turtle didn't get there by himself and neither did I and it reminds me to be grateful for all the people in my life that that elevated me to places I would have never been able to reach on my own or with my own skills or in my own strength. Then some of you would say, but wait a minute. Did anybody ask the turtle if that's where he wanted to be? <laughs> there you go. You are connected. And, and some people can lift you to places and put you places where you would just rather not be. You, you weren't made to be. And so it's not the fact that we have connections. We are connected. It's what kind of connection we have and who do we connect with. L let me just go through Paul's list here in the top 10. Flip over with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. Now, remember the connection here. If you just flip back just a few pages there in your Bible in the New Testament, uh, right after Philippians, uh, there is Colossians, the book of Colossians. This is the letter that Paul wrote to the entire church at Colossae. And he mentions many of these same people by name. And in chapter 4, as he finishes the, the teaching and what he wants to say to the church at Colossae, he again, as is his custom, goes down through this list and mentions people that are with him, helping him, laboring with him, or that are connected to the church. And so Paul is once again just making a relational connection. In fact, if you do this, for me, if you would, some of you may want to make some notes during this time, but if you just take out your uh, uh, connection devices here, that's what we'll call them. I just feel awkward uh, calling them Chinese finger traps. To me, that's just kind of a, why do we call them that? So I don't know what they're called. I don't know the official name. I just thought this is the only thing I could think of to, to illustrate our connections this morning. So would you take those out? In fact, can I have a volunteer uh, from the youth? here this morning uh and would you who, who would that volunteer be come on come on come on come on come on come on okay at a boy here we go oh set, four of you guys give your deals to it okay can we do that uh oh who broke theirs somebody's cleaning that up elliot uh-huh we have a different kind of connection all right, 
So I heard there was a challenge this morning to see if you could put those on all five of your fingers and connect them together. Okay, there you go. And? And? All right, now let's see if they're connected. Okay, now get them apart. Oh, you can. Okay. Can I use my mouth? Ooh. He's resourceful. Can I use my mouth? Many people do to try to sever connections in their lives. <laughs> Preach it, brother. Preach it. Help me with the illustration here. Can you help a pastor out? <laughs> hey, man, did you get it? And is it awkward? Yes. And it's uncomfortable? And, and what's the uncomfortable part? Is it physical? Or is it emotional? Letting this be your preaching debut, feeling a little awkward, like what in the world are we doing? Getting roped into it. But you feel better about standing next to me because we're friends, right? I guess. <laughs> Here, put your finger in there. We need to make a deeper connection, bro. All right? There we go. <laughs> we, we could really get it. Okay, here's the point. There. Take that off. All right? We can do this. We can, we can get connected at that level. Yeah, but we can't get a, it, it free by ourselves. And the connections that we make sometimes are deeper and stronger. Some of us just make surface connections and we know what's coming, so we didn't slide our fingers all the way in. And some of us don't press in to relationships to that level, so it's easy for us to step out. And then some of us are willing to take a little bigger risk of, uh-oh, uh uh-oh, and get something from somebody else that we don't have to take the relationship to a more intense way. And then we realize, uh-oh, I- I'm kind of stuck here. And that wasn't the point uh, to do that or to embarrass or to, to get somebody stuck. The point was to illustrate the power of connection and relationships and what it takes to disconnect. Thank you, man. Good job. All right. So every one of us, if you would now, put your finger back in your connection device and and the person next to you connect with them now some of you are already negotiating here and navigating in your mind thinking okay wait I still have one hand free so we'll go there some of you are single and this is your first uh, time here at church this morning and you're going jackpot I like this place <laughs> hi sister and you're reaching over the pew that's too obvious. So, are you with me? All right. Now, the point is, sometimes it's easier to connect than it is to disconnect. That's the way it should be. And, and some of you are saying, this is my opportunity. And some of you are connected with your mothers and you're going, oh, come on. This is the longest point in the sermon. And others of you are like, Okay, I've been to this church, I'm a part of this church, but this is just weird. Look, it's Labor Day weekend. You know, most people don't even come. So you're blessed today to, to, to be here, all right? And so just get a feel. Obviously, the more you try to pull away without establishing, ta-da-da, without establishing some consistency there, Holding, holding the thing together, and then you can slide your hand out. But as soon as you let it go, now it repositions. All right, but if you slide your finger in and you make a commitment, you make a connection, and then you try to pull it out, either, even if in a negative way, if we do the Elliot thing, then we say, yeah, I can disconnect, but really I'm still connected. Now, don't y'all tear them up because we gotta, we're going to finish. And somebody has to vacuum this week. Oh, the youth are going to volunteer. Okay, I'm no, just kidding. All right? Here's what I want you to see. In fact, let's, let's do this. If you just go ahead and take those apart now. Let me give you the fill-ins so it doesn't have to be really awkward. And then you actually take notes, but you don't take your connection device off. And then when you get home, you can't read your notes. So, so let, me, let me give you this. On the, the right-hand side of the page there, it says, what kind of connection do I make? Here, here's the questions. 
Who do I connect with? And as we're, we're going to go down through Paul's list here in just a second. But, but let me skip ahead and say, what kind of connection do I make? And that's very important. Because when we go through the list, not all of these guys were the cream of the crop. Paul didn't list their names because their relationships were perfect. They never had any struggle, never had any problems. In fact, some of these guys Paul had real issues with or some of their decisions caused relational dynamics with Paul and his companions and they were sharp disputes and they separated and they were missionaries. Some of the biggest struggles on the mission field aren't with finances and transportation and resources and logistics and demons and all of those things, although we fight those. Some of the biggest challenges on the mission field are relationships among missionaries. Because God has called us to connect. One of those uh, people that he lists here, John Mark, um, bailed, left him. And it was Barnabas's cousin. Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so here's Mr. Encouragement and, and Paul the Apostle going together and, and he's got a relative, a cousin, a young guy that wants to go with him and when the, when the intensity comes in the midst of the battle, he bails on him. Later, Paul de defines it and says, he deserted us. And so he didn't want to take him back. He didn't want to give him another shot. He, he didn't cut it. And so sometimes when we try to disconnect, the intensity of that it is not a good thing. So here's the fill-ins. What kind of connection do I make? Do I make a strife connection or a life connection? Yes, I came up with that myself. A, a strife connection or a life connection? And I just worded it that way so you could remember it. Here, here's the point. Unforgiveness connects us to people in a negative way. Just like we could say uh, when, when we tore away and we broke the relationship, it's not the fact that I'm connected anymore, it's that the relationship is connected to me. That unforgiveness connects our hearts to people in a negative way. Unforgiveness makes us a prisoner to ourselves and our own attitudes. And when we forgive, a prisoner is set free and the joy is to find that the prisoner was us. The bigger person forgives first. The, the, the bigger person is the one to, to push in before they pull out. To push in, to lean in, to, to give it some extra, to, to make that commitment. So when we pull out, it's not just the relationship that's broken, but there's still an attachment, there's still a connection. And now it's, well, it's easier for me to get free when we're still connected to it and it's still connected to us. Purpose, the second part, is what connects us to people in a life-giving way. You got it? The reality is we're all connected. It's the fact that some of us just have strands of, uh, uh, of what, what used to be a, a complete or a, uh, an effective method of connecting, and now that's been sheared, broken, cut. As Joel said, sometimes we use our mouth to do that. What a great illustration. Sometimes we use force. Sometimes we use instruments. Sometimes we try to use the sword of the Spirit. But the result's the same unless we do that effectively. And if we'll push in, we'll lean in, we'll give the relationship a little more effort, then it's much easier to be released from it so that it's not sticky it's not awkward it's not clingy and we don't have to go to the restaurant this afternoon after church and splain it 
Here's what's interesting in uh, praying about this message as it was coming up. I saw an article, I think it was online on Yahoo, about a couple who had been married for several years, but they chose to be handcuffed together for 48 hours. Nope, I'm going somewhere with this, so track with me. And some of you are already ahead of me going, all right, I, I love my spouse, but <laughs> I'd kill him. And they almost did. But so, so it's an experiment. What, what you probably need to know is that they pulled other stunts before. And one of their stunts was to visit, uh, I think it was 171 Starbucks in the same day. Okay, can you say caffeine overload? Can you say you need a life? Okay, even if you like Starbucks, that's overkill. So, so anyway, they've done things like that. And so there, somehow the challenge came up about taking their relationship to a different level. And so they literally said, hey, how about if we handcuffed ourselves together for 48 hours solid? And so they made a commitment to do it, talked it through, whatever. And then the funny thing was that they didn't think the, the whole process through. That, that, that started by just the, you know, realizing after the cuffs had been applied, uh-oh, and they said, well, we did shower first because we knew we couldn't shower for the next 48 hours. And so that's what we did. And then the, the lady realized, you know, this is really kind of dumb that I wore a long sleeve button down denim shirt and slacks and whatever. And her husband wore, you know, the same type deal. And they're like, uh, okay, we got these clothes on and then we got handcuffed. And now, uh, how, how are we going to get them off to sleep or... Maybe not, but it's only for 48 hours. And so they kept kind of going. And so then they said, we went through our routine. And she said he would stand there and, and uh, use his phone with one hand while she was vacuuming. And then when he was working, making phone calls and callbacks, you know, that she had to just sit there and, and be connected. And so I, they're both right-handed. And so I think she volunteered to have her right hand. And so his right hand, uh, his right hand was free. It, it was his left hand. And so, you know, going through the whole deal, and then they realized, um, I don't know at what point, that, uh, uh-oh, um, I might have to go to the restroom. And so, rather than, you know, pray that that wouldn't be the case for 48 hours and causing other problems, they said, you know, the, the thing was that our, our, fortunately, our toilet was right beside our door, and so that we could give one another some privacy. And I'm thinking, uh, that wouldn't have necessarily come to mind as, as an option, that, that there's this connection, but now it's becoming awkward. See, and we see that sometimes we don't think it all the way through and we get connected in a relationship, and not just as a stunt, but, but when we start and we get to places like every relationship does that gets awkward or inconvenient. Or we realize that we get set in a, in a tone or in a mode that... We didn't anticipate. And now all of us are a little bit selfish, even if we've been married for a long, long time to the same person. And that we can get in our routines and we have our preferences. And so when we're talking about making connections, sometimes we have to go beyond that. The, the, the end of the story there with the young couple is that they're both still alive. Uh, they did not kill one another. But man, they were really glad to... to to get the experiment over with. And they realized how intense it had become at certain points. Sleeping, for instance, where they just had a different sleeping pattern and sleeping preference. And so one was a little more active in their sleeping, tossing and turning. That's a whole different deal when you're handcuffed. See? And so that connection point there. What I want you to see is that the Scripture calls us to connect and to connect at a deep level. And as we started this morning, let me give you the last three here, and we'll talk about the list that, that Paul mentions, because it's, it's powerful when we see who these people are. Um, that we, first of all, when we started service, we used those and said, we first of all, connect up to the Father. That how do I connect? How do I make that connection? Not just what kind, obviously that's not negative, it's a positive thing. But how many of you know, sometimes the enemy can use fear in our life even in connecting with God. What is this going to mean for me? What do I have to give up? What if God calls me to be a missionary in Africa? 
Well, what if God does this? What if God does that? Because we don't understand the heart of the Father. And when He says, look, I want you to give everything, and we're saying, man, uh, I don't know what that means. But He does. And so it's not that God wants to control the relationship, and God doesn't use, you know, titanium finger traps to, to get us to do His will. What God does is use the power of love that pierces our heart and spirit. And then give us His Holy Spirit that we would even know what love was. And when we look at the cross and we say, wait a minute, I thought I knew what love was. That, that, that it's more than a feeling. I think somebody wrote a song about that. But yeah, if Jesus was willing to love us and then use that as a standard, greater love has no man than this that he laid down his life for his friends. And then say, now that I have loved you, you connect, you love, you minister, you serve one another like I have served you. Jesus earned the right to set the standard on relationships. In his connection with us, and in his ability to connect us to the Father. And so Paul starts this letter to Philemon, not by connecting with him and his heart or a church, but by connecting to the Father in prayer. And starts the letter to Colossians and all of his other letters, either to people, uh, pastors, Timothy and Titus, or to churches, uh, Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians, by saying, I always thank the Father, or I pray to the Father, here's my prayer for you, as a church body, or here's my heart for you, my prayer for you as an individual and as a person. And so Paul, first of all, connects up to the Father. Everybody say up. We connect up to the Father, but then he connects in with a small group. He connects in with a small group, and he says, this is in my heart. I know what's in your heart. I see your example and how you've lived, that you refresh the hearts of the saints, is what he wrote to Philemon. To Colossians, he points out several things that are characteristics of them as a church body, as a church family. And not in a generic way, in a specific way. Here's the qualities I see in you. And then he says, after you've read this letter, take it and read it to the church at Laodicea and get their letter and read it in your church and, and have this exchange. But I'm not writing to them, I'm writing to you. And he connects in with a small group and here in Philemon, he mentions 10 people by name. In Colossians, he mentions several more, but specifically by name. Not, not you guys are doing such a great job, and you got a super church. He wasn't playing cheerleader. He was writing genuine notes of love and encouragement. And the last thing that Paul uh, exemplifies for us is that we connect out with the needs of the world. How, how do we connect effectively? First of all, we connect up to the Father. How else will we know what to do? Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, as He defined it in the same way, those same steps, I only do what I see the Father doing. That, that He spent this time in uh, uh, setting apart time for prayer and seeking God because that's what the Father's calling me to do. And so He was connecting up to the Father. All the while, He was connecting out or, or into this small group of men that he had called to leave their lives and to connect with him and to stay connected with him. For three years, he poured into them. Left their businesses, homes, families to follow him, but Jesus connected in and he kept pushing deeper and getting into their hearts. And he didn't just show them power and demonstrate things. He would tell them and explain to them. And sometimes he wouldn't explain it. He'd just ask a deeper question. And it would draw them in deeper, more of a connection. And then he would turn their focus outward as he would his. And as he spread out his hands and expressed God's love to the whole world, he would communicate to them after his resurrection, now here's what you do with that. You take what I did and you take the message of new life and resurrection into the whole world and you disciple them like I discipled you. You stay connected to the Father and you connect with a small group of people around you 
who, who are going to make a difference, your team, your top ten, and, and you connect to the needs of the world, you just go find a need and fill it. You go find a hurt and heal it. As Pastor Tommy Barnett says, what a great way to start. What, what do I do? Where do I go? Well, start somewhere. Start here. Start across the driveway. Start with the, the, your child's heart that's, that's hurting. Start with the fact that you said something that you shouldn't say. Start with going back to make it right so that it's not a strife connection, it's a life connection. And that we're healing those connections instead of people say, I don't want to connect. We end up like the two guys on the small group video in outer Siberia never to be heard from again. Because we like it here. But it's cold. But there aren't any people. But it's real inconvenient. But it's more convenient because I don't have to share. And what we do is deceive ourselves into thinking, I don't need anybody. The greatest lie ever. And we're the turtle on the fence post having a great time not realizing I didn't get here by myself. So let's look at this list and then we'll pray. Here Paul says in uh, Colossians chapter 4, let me just read these last few verses here, starting with verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus. Everybody say Onesimus. You remember who he is? He was the runaway slave in Philemon's letter. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Here Paul's writing later. The the relationship has been reconciled not only in that level, but to a point that he's not just back as a servant in Philemon's house, and all the legal stuff's been patched up, he's part of the church family. He's part of the church body. Later, he would become the bishop of Colossae. He would become the leader of the church. He would surpass Philemon's role, not just hosting the church, leading the church, building the church. And so Paul here is affirming so powerfully his connection with a guy that had disconnected. That, that was, had a strife connection to Philemon and he turned it back and turned it around into a life connection. And it, it not only healed their relationship where they, you know, at least we got along, we just sat on other sides of the church. No, we came together in our hearts to lead the church in unity, and to make it more and better than it ever could have been before. How many could say amen to that? Think that's a life connection? Th- then he goes on and says, not only is he a dear brother and one of you, they, now he connects Onesimus' heart to Tychicus, they will tell you everything that's happening here. Here would be in the prison cell in Rome in which Paul was writing this letter. Even when he's disconnected and he's in prison, he's staying connected through those that he's sending. Those that are just serving. Paul, is there anything I could do? Can can I take a letter? Can I take a a, a parchment? Can I uh, uh, share with them your heart, your sentiment? And as they would pray and the Holy Spirit would speak to him, even there he's pastoring, he's ministering, he's connecting with the hearts and spirits of people that he needs in his life, but he hasn't used his difficulty to become selfish he's used it as a deeper opportunity to continue serving and sending and ministering and speaking through words on a parchment and through the heart and sentiment of hey when you guys go give them this letter but tell them this tell them how i'm doing tell them about the other day when this happened tell them about the prayer time tell them about when the holy spirit came as we were just interceding and and spending that time tell them about that Tell him about those experiences. He goes on. It, to me, it gets better. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings. Aristarchus, if you follow the, the trail there, connected with Paul in the book of Acts. And when there was a riot in Ephesus, 
Aristarchus got caught up in it because he was a companion of Paul. And the Scripture says they seized him, Aristarchus, and his uh, partner Gaius, the one that he was with. They were ministering alongside Paul. They get upset with Paul because he's preaching against Artemis of the Ephesians, the great goddess, and the silversmiths start a riot. And so they send him after these guys. And then when they find out that Paul's a Jew, they, they come and they seize Aristarchus and Gaius. How many of you have been in those situations? I'm not the preacher. I'm just here. I'm just traveling with the guy. I'm just helping him. I'm just distributing the literature. And so here they seize them and rush into the theater, basically hold them hostage. And then for two hours, a huge crowd gathers and they're chanting and they're screaming at the top of their lungs, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! You need a few guys that you can affirm that you've been through some battles with. Some guy that's not afraid to get in the middle of the mess and stand there with you. It wasn't just some cheesy surface relationship because here Paul's writing years later and he said, man, who, uh, 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 Aristarchus, he, he's, he's there. He's, he's one of us. He's a fellow soldier. Why? Because we've been in the same battles together. And so he, he greets him by name. Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark. Talked about that earlier. The cousin of Barnabas. Mark was inconsistent. Mark failed him. Mark deserted him. But yet Paul brings him back. They make a different plan. But there's a separation. There's disagreement. Even in the book of Acts chapter 13 and, and chapter 15. And so they resolve it temporarily by saying, okay, Barnabas, you go this way. You take somebody else. I'll take Silas. I'll go this way. And so the disagreement was whether or not Mark was ready to go again. Notice they didn't give up on him. But Paul didn't think he was ready. And, and Paul was still dealing with the fact that, man, when, when we were in the midst of battling demons in that city, he bailed on us. Maybe that was it. Sometimes it just gets too intense. Man, I don't know. I didn't sign up for this. I'm not ready for this. And so Paul said, when, when it got rough, he, he bailed on us. I don't know we should take him again. And him and Barnabas got in a sharp disagreement about that. I mean, grateful that God can turn strife connections into life connections. So he brings it full circle, and he says, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, he's here. I'm affirming him. He's on my top ten list. He's helping me. And then he says in parentheses, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, I don't know if those instructions were from Paul as a warning that, that, you know, he's a little inconsistent. He's, he's not real steady. Um, he's still working on some of that faithfulness stuff. Uh, paying the price, working hard. I don't know. Or if those instructions were, hey, you might have heard that, that there was some issues here with our team and, and we, we had a little uh, a disagreement. We've worked through that. And so we just want you to know. Maybe it was the fact that here he was, he was hurting. And when he deserted him and when he fled, he did what Peter did. And he went out and got overwhelmed with grief and started, you know, putting all the focus on him. And how could I be so stupid? And why? I Man, I just, I, he told me it was going to get tough. And I just plowed right through it. And then I just failed him. Maybe it was, listen, make some mistakes. He's a good kid. You guys help him. Maybe there's some gifts that he hasn't discovered that we've spoken into. Maybe he's wrestling with where he is right now. Maybe he's just immature. Who's on your top ten? Because Mark made Paul's even though he made mistakes. Aristarchus made Paul's even though that would have kind of been a deal of, look bro, uh, if you're expecting riots and stuff and the I'm just not at that place. Not that I'm scared and not that I'm weak. I have, I have a family. I, I don't have the greatest physical body, but it's the only one I have. I like it. I don't want it torn to pieces by idiots. And, man, we, this is getting intense. 
Come on, somebody. See, do you realize that there's still people giving their lives for the gospel? Not, not just deciding whether it's convenient to come to church on Labor Day weekend. You realize the news reports don't cover the 700 churches in Egypt that were destroyed. That's just in there. Or the chemical weapons that were used, not just in people, pastors. And the persecution and the beatings and the threats that take place because of this. It's still going on. And when we realize that that God includes us here and we have an opportunity to make connections with people, to, to speak the life of God and to release greater gifts than we ever could before, don't overlook the fact that, you know, oh yeah, Paul's just saying, oh yeah, and these guys like you too. I got a connection with these men and women. And these people mean something to me because I know them personally and we've walked through this thing together. Then he finishes here, as we do. Not only Mark, but Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Can we move past our ethnicity? Can we move past the the ethnic limitations that we put on it? Can, Can we widen the circle and the connection beyond what we're familiar with or or those who would go with with our customs and be who we are. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, is a servant of Christ Jesus. He sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I want one of those guys in my life. How about you? I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor. I love all my doctor friends. And Demas. Send greetings. No no qualification under his name. But yet Paul would write to Timothy, and he would say, Timothy, Demas was with us, but because he loved this present world, he deserted us. Again, Paul didn't take the cream of the crop. Paul speaks into their failures. Paul speaks into their need. Paul speaks to the parts of their heart that need encouragement. And Paul draws out, man, this guy, this guy Epaphras, he, he's, he's going to the mat for you. And I'm vouching for him that he's working hard. Anybody ever affirm you to somebody else and you didn't even know it? And, and then the word came back? How, how about if that was in the Scripture? For all eternity. What an awesome thing. And so he he finishes the list. Luke the doctor. Demas who deserted us. But now he's one of us. He sends you greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. And to Nympha. And the church that meets in her house. It's one thing to cross the ethnic line. Then we cross the gender line. Somebody say help us Jesus. After this letter has been read to you, see that it's also read in the church at Laodicea and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Last, he says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work that you've received in the Lord. Remember who Archippus was? Philemon's son. Philemon's son. In Philemon's letter, he calls him a fellow soldier. When he writes back to the church, he said, Made a good start. He just needs to finish. Needs to finish strong. If I could change it a little bit in our vernacular, it was kind of a man up and get it done message. In a life-giving way. But he's saying, son, you need to finish this. You need to complete it. How many of us need words of encouragement like that in our life? How many of us need to know that we're on a list like that And that we're connected with somebody that's doing something so phenomenal for the kingdom of God. But at the same time, the only way we can be on that list is when we have names like that on our list. Because the connection works both ways. And if we release the life that God has given us in that way, what an incredible thing it is. Can you say amen? Would you bow your heads with me here?
Let's just pray together to finish out this time, can we? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person in this room this morning, those that will hear this online or via video or streaming, whatever method. Lord, I thank You that Your Word doesn't return void. It accomplishes the very purpose for which it's sent. One of the reasons that You sent Your Son was not to establish relationships, but to heal those that had already been damaged. And Jesus came to heal physical bodies, and He began to, came to heal the broken and the burdened. He came to heal those that didn't have a way to forgive and find it at that level in their heart. Came to heal marriages and relationships. Came to heal hearts. So Father, I pray this morning that as we connect with You, there would be a fresh flow of that healing into our lives. And I pray that that healing would flow to those closest to us, that circle of influence and touch, our small group, our team, our family, those that we share life with and those that we're connected with but might not have realized why or how or what level or the potential that there is in every connection. Father, start a ripple. Start it in our hearts. Let it go out to, to those closest to us and then let it extend far from there when we take the focus from inward and we begin to turn around outward. When we begin to make connections with people that don't necessarily appreciate what we're doing, why we're doing it, don't understand how we're doing it. Those that would struggle to even move past themselves. Lord, help us heal the hurting one at a time through life-giving connections that Jesus empowers us to make. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move powerfully in our lives and help us be the answer to the prayer. Not just those that pray the prayer, those that become the answer to the prayer. Your prayer was that we would be connected as one, even as you and the Father were one. The Father, our hearts would be connected to that degree of love and grace and life and forgiveness, that it would freely flow from us, and there would be that same avenue, that conduit, that pipeline to flow right back into our hearts. Indeed, the Spirit of the living God would flow from within us, with not only life, but life more abundantly. Lord, I ask that you would do it. That we would intentionally focus on relationships that might have been broken or torn. That your healing would come. And that, Father, life would once again flow. That we would live connected lives, effective lives, powerful lives for the kingdom of God and because of his purposes in Jesus' mighty name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And you'd say, Pastor, I'm here today and I genuinely need a deeper connection to the Father. That, that I've been maybe trying to get those needs met in other ways and around me and it's not working. Well, it never will. But you see today, you, you hear it. Maybe it's there. Maybe God's just bringing you back. Maybe you're lifting up a hand that has a tattered connection device and you're saying, Lord, can you fix this? W would you use this again? If that's you, just lift your hand. I'm not going to have you come down front. I just want to connect with you intentionally, personally, just like Paul did. Amen. Others of you would say, my, my deal is I, I need to let people in. And I need to connect inwardly. And I need to have those people in my life that are that significant. And maybe it's one of those difficult ones like a name on a list that the relationship hasn't been perfect, hasn't been smooth. Maybe there's been some disappointment. Maybe you're the one that left. And God's calling you back to reconnect. Your heart says no. 
The pain says no. The difficulty says no. But the Spirit of God says yes. And you just want to be obedient to that this morning. I just want to connect with you in prayer. That's you. Lift your hand, would you? All over the building. Many of you. Amen. Others of you. Great. Fantastic. The last would say, all right, I get it. I'm not perfect in the other two, but what I really feel God's calling me to do is to reach out and make a difference in people's lives and the needs of the world. And I don't know how to do that. I, I don't know where to begin. It's not that God's calling you into full-time ministry. God's just helping you to see the power of connection and meeting needs. And it starts right where you are. And you'd just say, Pastor, I'm going to take the step this morning, the first step of just saying yes to God and being that person and being the answer to the prayer. If that's you, lift your hand all over the building. Glory to God. Would you all stand together with me this morning? And would you take hands with the person on either side of you? You, you don't have to use your connection devices. There you go. It's a willful connection. And you know you can escape. Let, let me pray for us one more time. Just a blessing and a benediction. And then if our prayer teams could be available uh, afterward. And uh, folks at the tables, small groups, sign up, all of that. Let's just end this right here at, at this portion. And then take that step to put it into practice. What God's speaking to us this morning. The decisions that we've made. Father, I just thank you that it's much more powerful to do life together and to be connected. Sometimes it's also more painful. It's because we care. That Jesus is our example. There were people that rejected His love, even the, those hanging beside Him on the crosses that day. One's heart was open and humble, realized that He didn't deserve it, the other spoke with hate out of his own pain. Father, I want to be those whose hearts are open and see even past ourselves and what we can see. I ask that you'd bless us here today as we responded and that God, you would help us to connect at every level. Let our lives be effective, powerful. Deliver us of the strife, bring healing. Let forgiveness through your grace, flow from us like a river. Father, let us be open to receiving it back in as well. Help us to connect. Somebody's here today and you're struggling in a marriage relationship. There's fear. There's pain. There's striving. You're just tired. I just want you to know that the Spirit of God Put your name on a list. It's not the naughty and nice list. It's the that need to be included list. And you're there. He affirms you. You're going to do it. You're going to make it. God's going to help you connect. He's going to help you lean in. Father, I just thank you as we let your spirit touch our lives as we're connected with one another here. Father, I pray that we would extend that connection and that you just powerfully help us share, receive from our inner circle, a small group. And then, Lord, I thank you for the power and the ability to touch the world and the connections that you've made uniquely through this church through the years that have influenced the world. Thousands, millions. We came to faith in Christ because we were connected with someone who went, a team that went, message that went. Thank you. Father, I just ask the Holy Spirit would flow like an electrical current through the connections that we make here and we realize that when we let the power of God flow through us in the same way, we, we just become conductors. We become the points that just make the connection. The power's not ours. The power's His. 
but He lets it flow through us. It's just one more thing, like Breck was talking this morning, that we can give. Father, I pray that we would do it generously as you did for us. In Jesus' name. Now, would you release those hands? Just open your hands to the Lord right there, would you? Come on, you may want to lift your head. You may just want to look up. You may just want to lift your hands to Him. Just connect in a moment right here with the Father, would you? Thank you, Jesus. Father, for loving us and bringing us in, for fathering us the awesome way that you do. Thank you for this incredible example. And the notes of intimacy that you write to us that bring us to a deeper connection every time. Write them on our hearts. Help us to read them over and over until it gets down in us. Just like this note to Philemon. Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the word says you are the letter. Living letters read of men. Don't hide it. Go let people read. They'll like what they see. Amen. Hey, hope you have a great time. Restful Labor Day without going into labor. And, and laboring and whatever, unless you're ready for that. So go get them. Hey, connect with one another this morning. Small group sign-up table out here. Wonderful time together. Connect with some folks around you. What a great time in the Lord. Blessings.